Hello again, everybody. So today we are going to talk about the culture of the Song Dynasty and a lot of different things. So let's just get right into it. Once again, the bureaucracy and meritocracy is very, very important, and it is very, very sophisticated as far as this administration was concerned. Again, under the Emperor Song Taizu, who you see there on the right, it was expanded to some of the lower classes so that they could enter the civil service. And the idea is like, look, in China, we have a lot of people. So if we have a lot of people, odds are we have a lot of people that are good at things. So let's get out all the people who are good at stuff. Um, they did have a system of recruiting individuals through competitive examinations and stuff like that. Like they would kind of generally go to these schools and administer some tests so they could, with, with specific purposes of who they were looking for, um, which the, the change here is going to be very interesting because you can actually, again, be chosen through your job through merit, not necessarily who your parents were. Again, because you have to pay for school, let's be very clear that the upper classes still have an advantage here. That's very, very clear, but opportunities are there. Now, I have here job classifications. Basically, jobs aren't hereditary anymore, and, and that's huge, okay? Now, if I'm a tax collector and I want my kids to be a tax collector, I have enough money that I can send my kids to school to try to make sure that they have those opportunities. So in a way, I can try to keep, you know, have my job go down to my children, but it isn't just a lockdown. Um, the education, again, was the focus, and a lot of things were on Confucian ideals, history, law, stuff like that. Now, printing made it even more accessible because more and more people actually had an opportunity to get some books to learn how to read and give give themselves a chance to get into these schools. And just to give an idea of how big this thing got, in the alert, early 11th century, around 30,000 people per year were taking the tests, but by the early 13th century, that number went up to 400,000. So you're talking about a massive education scale that we weren't seeing in, in anywhere else in the world. And as a result, you have a new class of people being formed, and this picture um, represents that, is the scholar gentry. So these were your educated bureaucrats. Um, and many of them were also scholars, historians, scientists, stuff like that. This, this group of people that were like a borderline noble group. And in fact, their numbers were actually more than the landed aristocracy. So that gives you an idea of the importance, once again, of this education, all right? Now, the purpose of the scholar gentry is very, very important, and there's a few. I mean, part of it is also like history and knowledge. Um, the empire had a really focus, had, had a really big focus on this type of stuff, you know? That's kind of a cool thing. Um, but also, not only would these folks, with the numbers that they have, not only would they be helping to run the federal government, they would also be helping to run the local governments and tax collection and all of these different things. And as a result, they end up earning quite a bit of money. Not going to lie, some of them would skim stuff off the top, but that's kind of what you have. So you have this group of like educated, noble bureaucrats that we, we just didn't see this anywhere in the world at this time. Okay. So, women and the family, uh, some good, some eh, not so good. Um, one of the key things here is filial piety. This is a kind of the overarching principle of the culture of the song, and in much of China before this. I mean, filial piety goes way back. It was a big thing that Confucius stressed, and of course, Confucius is the man here. So the key principle here is that society is ordered, okay, and it needs to be ordered. Because without that, it all falls apart. The dominant role here would be the patriarchy, okay? Um, and that the patriarchy is something that was established by the gods. 
and the idea of a male-dominated and male-descended society is very crucial here. All right, when I talked about some previous stuff in China, uh, if you remember, that idea of men being at the center of things goes back thousands of years. It's really, really important. But the, the, the general idea within filial piety is that you need to be good to take care of, respect, and obey your parents. And it's this concept of the parent here, okay? This general idea of obeying the parents. You see in the picture, the parents are sitting on the elevated days there, and then most likely their son in front of them. You have probably another son and daughter to the left there, that this is very, very important. And this doesn't just extend to your family, then it branches out, because the idea is that the government and local government officials are looked at, or looked in a way that they also represent parents, if you will, okay? And the focus then becomes is by having this respect, you will also bring good name to your parents and family outside the home. And that's what's really important as well is that everything is, is around the family, okay? Is that everything you do, not only must you honor and, and obey your parents, particularly your father, let's be honest, he's got five, final say here, and that's legally as well. But everything you do reflects upon your family. So there's a tremendous amount of pressure there. And everything is based on respect. You need to be aware of the burdens of the, your parents. You need to be aware of the burdens of the government and what they do for you. Therefore, you must respect them at all times. And so thus the family is the key focus of everything. And being loyal and obeying your parents would reflect that idea, would be reflected, I'm sorry, in the idea of obeying your local rulers all the way up to the emperor. Respect, follow the rules, order. And the thing is, if you go against that, um, not good for you. Okay, you can be thrown out of your family and a familyless person. I mean, you've, you've basically got no chance. No, no chance. Women's rights. All right, well, this is kind of interesting here. We're going to get some good and then some not so good. Oh, my last word got cut off at the bottom, but it's okay. That word is business. So anyway, um, because women were expected to educate their children, particularly the boys, they did have to have some education as well. So a lot of women actually were literate mainly because they had the responsibility of, like, teaching their own children. Um, it is under the song that women get some property rights. Um, unmarried daughters without brothers or a surviving mother could actually inherit half of her father's property. Um, it would be doled out to other male relatives, but you know, before women couldn't get any property. Property rights is really important, guys, because the idea is that one of the ways you control women is that you don't give them access to anything. They can't own property. They can't go into business, all this type of stuff. And so if you prevent that, that shows a level, obviously, of oppression here. So here you get a little bit of, of change. Um, also, some women during the Song Dynasty were, middle, uh, were military leaders as well. Um, many in the Yang family were famous of that. And probably the most famous Song general was Liang Hongyu, who I have there a, a little painting depicting her. Um, so if some people had a military mind, remember, we like merit here, so we're going to put people in charge. You also had a number of emperor, uh, empress dowagers. So when an empress dowager, basically you have the emperor dies, but his heir isn't old enough to really control anything yet. You get the empress dowager. Now, for the most part, a lot of these empresses were kind of pushed to the side and they really wanted to be involved in state affairs. Uh, and that would be changed during the song. Um, women would be permitted to be involved in state affairs, would be able to help make decisions, and would often um, act as uh, advisors to their sons. Probably the most famous of which being the Empress Wu on the right there, who did reign for a long time. Um, so we're seeing some positives, and women could run and own their own businesses. Not a lot of women did, but some did. So it's like, hey, it's all great. Look at all these changes. Yeah, it's, it's, no, there's still so many different things. And I think one of the biggest things that I'm going to show you here is, is just a little clip here on, on foot binding. 
because this is something that went all the way through the earlier parts of the 20th century. This becomes the in thing for women during the um, during the Song Dynasty and then afterwards. And and you'll see it's kind of graphic. It's it's this isn't good. <laughs> Ninety-one-year-old P. Shu wanted to show us the process, which has left her with no feeling in her feet. From the age of seven, she would have to do this every day or face a beating from her parents. It was very sore. The tendon in the arch of her foot and the bones in her toes are broken. Like all girls at that time, she was told she'd never marry if she didn't have small feet. Foot binding dates back to the 10th century in China, when tiny feet were deemed a sign of refinement and beauty. The shape of a bound foot was said to resemble a lotus flower, and the most desirable of brides would possess a three-inch foot known as a golden lotus. Mm. Liu Su oh. says she cried all day when she got it done, and the memory is still upsetting. She has kept two pairs of shoes. These were actually too big for her. The 94-year-old's feet are badly deformed. Her daughter talked us through the binding process of breaking each toe apart from the big toe and wrapping them tightly under the sole of the foot to create a single point. It so that's going to give you a sense of just how brutal this was and, and that, that women would become physically altered. Um, women are also not allowed to get a divorce, but men, of course, couldn't. Um, in many cases, though, if a woman had sons for inheritance-wise and um, her husband died, like, she really didn't get anything. It's whatever the sons decided. Um, that's the key thing. Like, if there's any boys anywhere around, they're just going to have precedence over the women. Um, culturally, widows were expected not to marry again. Um, now, the lower classes often ignored this, but for upper-class women, that was going to be the case, and again, that would really limit your ability. Um, and the emperors still had extensive harems, lots of prostitution, um, you know, it, it, it was rough. And what you see is, is something that we've seen for centuries at this point, you know, women trying to get equal rights, it's just virtually impossible. Um, now, moving on to something a little more positive culturally, um, during this time, festivals become a really big thing, and festivals are really, really important in, in China. Um, it's something where you really get the family together. Again, I talked about the importance of families already. Uh, the Lantern Festival is definitely the big one. This is in February or March of every year. This is, this is a, a lunar celebration. Um, the Lantern Festival occurs on the final day of New Year's celebrations. And the whole idea is you design these lanterns and you let them go um, because you're letting go of your past so that you can focus on the future. Um, children's as gift often gets like little puzzles and stuff. And many of the lamps, which or the lanterns, which many of you have seen, are often red because that is a symbol of good fortune. But nowadays, modern day, you see here, you have these giant lanterns that are formed and they have big displays and parades and all sorts of stuff that are really, really, you know, it's something that's really exciting that people love and becomes, you know, whether it's the lower classes to, to the higher classes, this is like the big day of the year. Um, the King Ming Festival is also super important. This is right around April 4th or 5th each year, again, lunar-based. Um, this is a memorial or ancestors day when you visit tombs, you clean the tombs, you pray them, you do some ritual offerings, um, you often, you, you can make things, and then the, they would have like little, uh, also little like festivals around it where like cities would often provide like puppeteers or musicians, uh, little theaters, bank banquets, 
lots of lots of things would be made available to the people. So you kind of start on this like solemn aspect in which you're like kind of venerating your ancestors. Again, this goes back to Chinese ancestor worship, super important. But then you, you also have some fun that, that's built into it as well. Printing and li literature become super huge here. And what you get is massive printing leads to greater number of books and thus increases literature and, and, and literacy. We do have the woodblock printing, which is wood that would be pressed into paper or silk. And then someone would coat the raised areas with ink. Um, this is still labor intensive, but it's still way faster than anything else. And here on the right, you see, here's your wood block, and then there's the paper that would go, okay? Um, Gutenberg, of course, is gonna take that to the next level over in Europe in a few centuries, but this becomes huge. Um, some of the top guys to know here, you have Lee Bo, who is this gentleman right here. And he was known for, as a poet, and lots of work that discusses love and friendship and, and wine and, and, you know, really, really kind of a positive type of thing. And then you also have on the right there, uh, that is Du Fu. He's a bit more somber and is a guy that would write and talk about, um, the difficulties of daily life and struggles. And you can, you can see this because the differing styles here, because Li Bo lived during the height of the Song Dynasty, whereas Du Fu was living near the end with Mongol invasions and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, travel literature is also really popular. We'll talk about that. You know, people love to read books and and hear about things far away. So Fan Gengda, uh, the record of Stone Bell Mountain, which was basically a travel book about Stone Bell Mountain and things like that, was really, really um, important. And then you have lots of writing like the, the Zhiji Tongzhan. I think that's right. It could be very wrong. But um, this is a history and encyclopedia work. So it's just a gathering of... Uh, knowledge just like an encyclopedia that you would you know wikipedia is online today i would say britannica but no one know what i was talking about that makes me sad but anyway um this was huge this the, the Zhiji Tong jian was thousand a 1000 volume and 9.4 million character work that just compiled knowledge of the day so super super important Visual arts are very, very important here. You had a patron system that I'll talk a lot about in other areas, particularly in Europe. Um, the idea is that wealthy, uh, one of the ways to show your wealth is to pay artists to create work. And that's what, because the fact of the matter is, is guys, is to be an artist is hard, but you need to make money somehow because you need to eat. And so when you have a patron system developed, that means you often get a period of really intense expansion of art, and we see that at this time. Um, the Emperor Hu Zong, who's pictured there, was actually known for being an artist himself. Uh, probably the most well-known artist was Zhang Zeduan, who um, lived from 1085 to 1145, and he did lots of man, uh, massive landscapes and stuff like that. The picture on the right you see there is along the river during the King Ming Festival. Um, really, really popular artist and and you know so we have literature we have art we have festivals um you have a lot of stuff going on in china right now lots of celebrations and and the song are going to be at the heart of it but really i think the one that we go to the most is is the printing the printing that's going to get out and that eventually will develop into the printing press um and that spread of knowledge is going to be some of the more significant things at this time okay all right, guys, so hope you enjoyed that one, and we've got one more left in our series here, and I will see you soon.